Is that all right? Is that uh, I would prefer it to be the whole screen on here. I'm not sure why it is. Okay, so it's this one that we need to maximize, minimize the uh, view. View, view, the view, 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 view. There we go. Full screen. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so last, uh, where we ended off last time. Uh, let's see. Okay, so so I um, finished last lecture by um, concluding that for this this uh, type of turbulence, the dissipation can actually heat at large scales in all of in all the phase space, so similar scales to where the energy is injected. So uh, this next um, section, I'll talk about another way to view that phenomenon. Uh, so the turbulence here is driven by some unstable eigenmode. This is called for this system, it's the ion temperature gradient driven mode. I believe that you heard about this last week from MJ. Um, and some of you here in the room, I believe, are also uh, um, Bahama, for example, is studying instabilities like this. Now, uh, for a long time, it was just assumed that this unstable eigen mode drives the turbulence. And then the cascade shifts energy to smaller scales in K space. But since we're dealing with a high dimensional system, there is this other dimension in phase space that uh, that can be represented by different eigenmodes. Um, in the last lecture, we represented this other dimension in phase space in terms of Fermi polynomials. Uh, but you can also think of it in a different basis. This is kind of one thinking of two different basis sets. One is for each polynomials, one is different eigenmodes of linear operator. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about for this part of the lecture is conceptualizing the turbulence as an unstable, driven by an unstable eigenmode, and then uh, driving a cascade in K space, but simultaneously exciting subdominant eigenmodes at the same wave number as the instability. All right, so that's kind of abstract, I think, but uh, maybe it'll become more clear with some concrete examples. One way to look at this is using a technique called proper orthogonal decomposition. That's, this is a term that's been used in fluid turbulence quite a bit. Uh, other names for basically the same thing, singular value decomposition is the matrix decomposition. So uh, a uh, linear algebra um, technique. Uh, that's universal, I mean, universally um, useful in almost every area where one uh, uses linear algebra. I'm sure many of you are familiar, familiar with it from various applications. Uh, another name for principal component analysis. Anyway, this sort of technique is, um, is widely used in various fields. Uh, it's useful because it's an optimal representation. It, it produces an optimal representation. So what I mean by that is if you decompose a matrix, you can decompose a matrix, any matrix, let's take a matrix A, I, J, uh, you can decompose it in terms of uh, two sets of basis vectors. So the, the, outer product, the outer product between sets of basis vectors. <laughs> so, um, and then these are weighted by uh, what's called a singular value. So this decomposition you can show, um, you can prove it's optimal in the sense that if you truncate the decomposition, so instead of taking all n terms in this 
series that you take some r less than n. So the the um, so just one term in the series it captures more of the uh, behavior, more of the information than any other possible decomposition of this law. So it's you can think of it simply um, extracting an optimal basis set for whatever uh, whatever you're interested in. Okay, so if we look at this even more, get some more concrete examples. This what I'm showing here is um, some of these basis vectors from a proper orthogonal decomposition. The one on the upper left, this is the unstable eigenmode. And what this is actually showing is the eigenstructure of the electrostatic potential. So if you think of a tokamak, uh, big toroidal um, structure, then the uh, what I'm showing here is the electrostatic potential from this unstable eigenmode. It peaks here on the outside of the tokamak, and then it follows the field lines around like this. And as it gets to the inside, it gets small. And um, there are reasons why I, I expect MJ covered this last week. Reasons why it's uh, it's uh, peaked here at the outboard side of the tokamak. Um, so that's what I'm showing here is this uh, unstable ITG mode. Now, um, from the turbulence, from a nonlinear uh, simulation of the turbulence, we can extract, construct one of these proper orthogonal decompositions. So I'm taking a single wave vector and uh, performing this uh, matrix decomposition. And these are the other structures that come out of this proper orthogonal decomposition. These are just a few of them. This is, it looks like I've got, um, yeah, these are the first two, number one, number two. And then these are successively um, higher order terms of decomposition. So that's this part of the decomposition. This is one, this is the basic vectors that cover the spatial, um, the spatial information. Uh, the other basis vectors cover the time information. So this tells you the spatial, the phase space structure, and this tells you the time behavior of each one of these basis vectors. So I just have two examples here. The uh, lower, order, um, lower order vectors have kind of slower behavior in time, and if you go to higher number, it becomes more, you know, faster and faster in time. So the third part of this decomposition is the singular value, and this tells you how large, um, how much energy is in each one of these fluctuations. And so here you can see them, the, these singular values. The virtue of this decomposition is that it's optimal, which means that you'd expect it to peak very strongly in this low range. That would, that's what makes it an efficient decomposition. So this uh, unstable eigenmode right here is much larger than the others, but the others aren't negligible. This is number two right here. And you go down and they, they get smaller and smaller. So this is this is the um, energy in each one of these uh, eigenvectors. Um, okay, so just as an example, this is showing how these um, eigenvectors, how these uh, singular vectors uh, um, combine to uh, reconstruct this complex fluctuation data. So if we have just one term in the series right here, you can see that it doesn't match very well. The uh, the actual fluctuation, nonlinear fluctuations are the, the wiggly black line and the uh, the the most sense or the, the, the first singular vector is this red one. Um, so then if we had two of these, you can see it starts to become a little better um, and kind of evokes the same sort of uh, general shape. Uh, if you go up to 50, it's almost everything. You're just missing a few wiggles here, and then once you're up to 100, it's almost a, a perfect um, reconstruction. Okay, so another example, lots of, uh, lots of these singular vectors. Now, if you look at just the singular values, they decay quite quickly, but if you look at the dissipation, that's these 
um, that's the dissipation from each one of these, it actually uh, grows quite quickly with these uh, with the uh, the vote number. The reason why is because you're getting your as as the vote number increases, these have uh, uh, finer and finer scales. The finer scales are what um, create more dissipation. So it, um, to summarize, the energy is contained in just a few of these large scale structures. But since they get smaller and smaller scales, the dissipation actually is distributed among a large number of these structures. Uh, and if you look at this in case space, so this is, um, if you think back to our first uh, uh, figure for Kolmogorov um, turbulence, this is basically the same picture here. The energy injection is here at large scales. And in the Kolmogorov turbulence, the dissipation uh, can't, uh, can't um, happen until you get to very small scales. But for this system, once again, because you have this extra dimension in phase state that can give you dissipation, the dissipation is actually mostly in the same scale ranges as the energy drive. It does expand somewhat out with the smaller scales, but, um, but predominantly it happens in the same scale ranges as the energy injection. Uh, and as I said in the last uh, lecture, this is really convenient for us doing numerical simulations because uh, we don't have to uh, resolve decades of uh, scales in order to uh, resolve, resolve the dissipation, and it makes it a much more tractable problem than it might be otherwise. Okay, so if we have this kind of strange situation with um, energy injection and dissipation occurring in similar scale ranges, you might expect that these uh, that the scaling arguments for the energy spectrum uh, might not be valid and the energy spectrum might change. And um, okay, if we review these are the three assumptions um, from uh, the that, that we use to derive the Pomodoro five thirds law. Uh, separation of drive and dissipation isotropy and local energy transfer. Um, so which one of these have we violated? Exactly. If we, if we violate this one, there's no separation of the scales and no inertial range in between where you have this conservative, completely conservative um, transfer of energy. I haven't uh, touched on these two, but um, isotropy, it's not, Perfect. So there's extreme anisotropy in this case between the scales parallel to the magnetic field and perpendicular. But in the scales perpendicular to the magnetic field, it's roughly isotropic. So we can keep this guy. Uh, and then energy transfer is the energy transfer local or non local. What I mean by that is does that cascade shift energy um, abruptly to some other scale range, or is it cascading from one? locally from one scale range to another. Um, I haven't touched on that yet, but um, but uh, we did look at that and uh, found that indeed for this kind of turbulence, the transfer is local. So what this is showing is uh, for a given scale range, this is, is um, uh, looking at the uh, energy transfer in shells in the perpendicular wave number space. And red means that uh, energy is um, leaving from nonlinear from the nonlinearly from this scale. And blue means that it's going to this scale. So for this uh, wave number here or this shell of wave numbers, the energy is predominantly coming from the shell of wave numbers just larger, uh, just smaller, I mean, and going to the, the shell of wave numbers just smaller. So indeed. The um, the the tra energy transfer is largely local. The one exception to this is zonal flows, which um, which Leila studies, uh, and I'll show a picture of that, I, uh, a video of that. Um, I I wasn't able to get that ready for this lecture, but maybe I can just show it quickly at the beginning of the next lecture. Um, but the cascade in in K, it, the cascade small scales. Um, 
occurs basically locally. Okay, so there's two of these assumptions that are valid for this turbulence, uh, but the separation of drive and dissipation is not uh, not the case for this type of turbulence. So you might suspect to get much more exotic power laws than we see in a lot of fluid um, scenarios and and the prediction from the Kolmogorov scaling. And indeed you do. This is just a few examples. I mean, uh, really all bets are off in a real, um, uh, you know, tokamak uh, turbulence setting. Not only do you get dissipation in, um, in all this, this range of scales across here, but you also have different um, facts of instabilities that materialize in different scale ranges. So I've talked about the ITG um, instability that, that comes in right here, but there are other instabilities, you know, with other acronyms, trapped electron modes that come in here often, and then even at um, smaller trapped electron modes would be kind of this scale range, and then even smaller, there's the cousin of the ITG mode, the exact same physics, but for electrons instead of ions. So, and you can see that these, these uh, spectra, basically follow power laws, but it's very uh, unpredictable what exactly power law they will follow. Um, now, we have identified, if you kind of really idealize things and, and uh, construct the scenario, a little bit artificial, but a scenario with really strong drive, then you can um, kind of find uh, a scenario where you do get the Kolmogorov um, power law, but it's a little bit contrived to, to do that. Okay, so we wanted to understand this behavior in more detail, more on a more fundamental level. So um, we constructed a toy problem to look at what happens to power laws, to the Cassiagian power laws, when you have this dissipation that is at some level, but it kind of stands the whole range of your turbulent cascade. Uh, so this, this paper, um, Vasil Bratinov, he, uh, he was a, a graduate student when he did this work, but then he came and worked with me and Professor Mahajan in, uh, in Austin afterwards. So, he, um, so we looked at uh, a modified version of this equation, the kuramoto sudachinsk equation, Kind of a simplified 1D um, except the way this was done by Mahajan and Lark. I'm getting that. I'm getting that. <laughs> Has anybody heard of this equation, by the way? Anybody heard of the? Um, it's very well known in fluid turbulence. It's kind of, I mean, I don't know how many citations, hundreds or thousands of citations. Yeah, it's, really, it's really used as the um, uh, the model to understand um, flame, you know, fluctuations in, uh, in flames. So, for example, the video I showed at the beginning of the last lecture, uh, I'm sure uh, people have analyzed that sort of thing with the Kuramoto series. Okay, so this is just one dimensional. It has a, a nonlinear term, roughly similar, you know, advection, roughly similar to what you would see in, uh, in Navier Stokes. Um, and then two dissipation sort of terms. So um, it's uh, although it's known in the general community as the curve of the Sivichinsk equation, we at UT like call it the Lock and the Hodge equation. <laughs> so um, yeah, so this was uh, um, yeah, you, you actually, I mean, maybe you can just tell us the history for two or three minutes, slide it. Okay, shall we? So this, this was um, the work of my youth, my, my, when I was first postdoc position at Princeton. And we were analyzing what was called at that time, the trapped eye mode. And uh, the idea is that I'm very fond, very appreciative of Kolmogorov, but I believe that we try to post everything into Kolmogorov unnecessarily. Right, because the point is, Kolmogorov the situation comes into existence because of a peculiar condition, and that is that if you uh, now that you've given me some time, I take a few more minutes. 
if you remember, so you have, and let me look at you some vector. So you have the convective derivative, all right, and some dissipation, and then it goes in, right? And by definition, this forcing is the only thing which puts energy in the system. There is no instability in this equation. All right. So if you try to do some kind of a linear analysis, getting this one, mm -hmm. all that you get is that this much linear. That the linear mode must have. So you force it. But the important thing is that the dissipation takes place at is forced to take place at short wavelengths and missing at um, long wavelengths. But the point is most solar systems really do not have such thing. And as uh, um, David has shown, let's suppose that now we have to do the say from alpha be to one dimensional this problem and plus beta B for B. These are all physical terms. And let's further put uh, a U, new U equal to uh, equal to one. Hey, if you try to do a linear analysis of this thing, then, I mean of course there's like, yeah, there is the connective term which is which is really the more most important part. So if you could write you could find that omega is I k square um, alpha k square minus beta k four and minus i so the spectrum is unstable at some range of k it's cut off at large k it's cut off at short k okay and so what will happen is that uh, then the energy is being so generated it's not that you're forcing from outside there's an instability, and that instability comes from the radius. So if you look at this one, okay, and the energy is in this range, and this is greater than that, being generated. And so there's a dissipation range this side and dissipation range on the other side. And in fact, the total amount of so-called inertial range that one should expect of our spectrum is, is about small. So Kormogorov is a great guide. Better in most of the physical problem, you will really have to figure out what exactly are your parameters, as David is very nicely illustrated. And, uh, uh, and this is another example of something very interesting. This paper was written from Princeton, appeared in Physical Review Letters, right? But I'm more prescriptions, they write their paper three years later, all right? And I don't even know which journal it appeared in, you know. And uh, so nobody cited our paper in the literature, including plasma physics. Yeah, until a plasma physics, I think it was, um, I think it was Chromus that finally uh, resuscitated it, right? He pointed out that- uh, Dean, uh, John Dean, John Dean. Okay. Uh, it's a totally amazing example. You could say that, all right, you had sent a paper from the and it was published in some city and nobody knew. This was published from Princeton in physical user letters. So, <laughs> go on. All right. So, yes, I, I, uh, we did this before Swadesh enlightened me, <laughs> before I even knew Swadesh. So, we called it the Kuramoto Sibachinsky equation, unfortunately, at this time. Um, so, we, for this purpose, we modified it slightly. Uh, so these two terms, we added this, these two terms right here are the standard Kurlov-Sivitinsky equation. We added this term in the denominator. Uh, can anybody tell what, what happens now to this term as we go to large K, this whole term on the right? What's the, what's the limit in large K? I'm trying to keep you awake on Friday. <laughs> After a long two weeks. No, it's going to be, um, yeah, I mean, if it were just this term, it would, it would blow up. But with this term, these two, in the large K limit, these two terms, this one's negligible. These two are negligible. 
Yeah. Yeah. So then it just for, it just goes some flat level, which is roughly what we're trying to do is it roughly mimic this situation that I showed in our kind of complex, you know, big uh, nasty dark kinetic simulations. All we were trying to do is roughly mimic this situation where the dissipation um, kind of flattens out and is just a a steady but maybe small drain on the energy throughout the whole scale. Right there. Uh, so this would be the uh, the standard lockley mahajan equation, and we modified it to go like this. And then we can modify this, this B term here to make this go up and down in comparison with the, the drive, and then we can what happens to the, uh, to the spectrum as we do this. And what we find is that you can, this is really the, com the complexity in this problem comes in here. This is um, reworking the nonlinear transfer, coming up with a simple model for the nonlinear transfer between scales. And uh, once we identify this uh, form, a reasonable form of this term, you could solve this equation and um, find that, uh, I didn't actually put it up here, but you get to derive the spectrum um, and show that the spectrum goes like K to negative delta, where delta is this term right here. Lambda is some, roughly speaking, some nonlinear energy transfer time. And nu over b, these are these terms from here. This is just the, basically the dissipation level that you pull the, that you you select. And uh, so what happens is this there's a a, a natural um, if you didn't have this term here, you would have some natural power law. But with this term here, uh, the spectrum steepens in proportion to this dissipation level that, that we select. And so we did a whole range, large range of simulations, large range of scanning this parameter B, this dissipation level. And this is the prediction in blue and the nonlinear simulations are in red. And you can see that's a, a, uh, an effective, uh, a, a quite accurate um, model for the, uh, for the uh, spectrum. So in, in short, the, uh, it's maybe somewhat surprising. I mean, it, going into this, we kind of intuitively expected that maybe you add dissipation, you get some exponential decay instead of retaining a power law. But no, you actually do retain a power law if you have this kind of um, you know steady constant dissipation. You maintain a power law, but it steepens as you add dissipation. So roughly speaking, we think this is a good um, a good uh, paradigm for. Cascades and and power law spectra in this fusion turbulence. You can get any number of uh, uh, scaling exponents on your, on your spectrum depending on how you know what dissipation level or what even uh, energy injection level you have spanning your scale range. Yeah, let's see. So that was the end. That was supposed to be the end of the first lecture, but <laughs> but I've got lots of other things for. Um, uh, for lecture number two, which I don't think I'll be able to get through. But yeah, we'll, we'll go till the end of time. Okay. okay. Maybe you can just give more salient to do that. Yeah. Okay, so this is another I look at this is totally for the energy world, it's very difficult to Yes. Um Okay, so this is another um, another look at multiple the role of multiple eigen modes in the turbulence. So uh, the a big question about uh, ten to fifteen years ago was what do magnetic fluctuations do in tilt-back turbulence? Well, for a long time, electromagnetic effects are fairly challenging in these simulations. So for a long time, uh, we mostly did electrostatic simulations. So we just evolved the electrostatic potential and neglected the magnetic fluctuations. This is a reasonable assumption for some uh, some parameter regimes in Tokamax, but not for all parameter regimes. When we when we started doing electromagnetic simulations, we saw a 
kind of surprising thing. Uh, we saw that for this type of turbulence driven by this IPG instability, you actually get a reasonably large amount of electromagnetic heat flux. Uh, by what I mean by electromagnetic heat flux, these magnetic fluctuations um, produce magnetic silkacticity. So the uh, I think this was discussed earlier, and then the uh, the heat can escape the confinement simply by flowing along these perturbed magnetic field lines instead of going across field lines. And the reason why this was surprising is that the um, so what I'm showing here is for the ITG eigenmode, the electrostatic potential and the magnetic effect potential. The reason that this is surprising is because the structure of this eigenmode is such that you perturb the magnetic field when you're, uh, this doesn't work on the blackboard. You perturb the magnetic field when you're on, say, the bottom um, side of the tokamak. Uh, and so you, you're getting some, um, some perturbation again. Uh, oh, you, you, you have some magnetic fluctuation. But then, due to the uh, symmetry of the mode, that's canceled out when you go to the other side of the tokamak. So, the uh, assumption was that this sort of turbulence would not create any sort of magnetic stochasticity, magnetic chaos, and you wouldn't have any, we'd also not have any uh, electromagnetic heat flux. But in fact, when we do the simulations, we did find a substantial amount of electromagnetic heat flux. This is one example with kind of low beta. And, uh, and the, the total heat flux is very strange looking. This is a spectrum in K space. I, it's like I just seen the label here. But this is this is wave number here, and this is the spectrum of the heat flux. And uh, so what was found is that there is positive heat flux in most of the spectrum, but then this strange dip right here where the energy peaks. And this was completely unexplained for uh, for years. It was observed, but completely unexplained. So we looked at this from the lens of this proper orthogonal decomposition and wanted to see what other nonlinear structures were excited or what other eigenmodes were excited in the turbulence. And we found that indeed the second largest structure is this. It has exactly the opposite parity of the IPG mode. The uh, electrostatic potential has odd parity, and the magnetic vector potential has even parity. And this Sort of structuring exactly what you need to uh, to produce magnetic chaos and uh, produce uh, electromagnetic heat flux. Um, so what we found is when we do this proper orthogonal decomposition, the uh, total heat flux spectrum, this weird curve here in black, is the superposition of the contribution from the IPG mode, which actually has a negative contribution, and this second mode here. This, this we, we call it tearing parity, uh, which has a positive contribution. And we can track the energy in both of these modes throughout the, uh, the simulation. Uh, what you see is that the ITP mode here in blue grows up at the rate of the, the growth rate of the instability. And the second mode right here starts out, it's not unstable, so it starts linearly unstable, so it doesn't do anything for a while. And then Non-linearly, it couples to the ITG mode, and this give it, gives it twice the growth rate of the ITG mode, and eventually it grows up and saturates at some level. Okay, yeah, I have a movie of this. Okay, so this is the magnetic fluctuations. And you can see that it switches from one parity to the other. Kind of short, um, short movie. You can see that it switches from, from being odd parity 
to the union parity, and it's shuffling back and forth all the time. And what I'm showing here is the superposition of these two modes. So just two of these structures combine, and the red curve is the superposition of these two structures. The black curve is the total fluctuation. And you can see that these two contributions uh, combine to reproduce the nonlinear fluctuation um, throughout the simulation. Mostly, there's some, some discrepancies. So really, uh, we should not think of the turbulence as being um, completely characterized by one instability, but being a superposition of multiple fluctuations that are nonlinearly driven. And this explains some uh, some kind of puzzling features of um, or of the simulations. Okay, so this is a visualization. I think somebody was asking about um, magnetic chaos yesterday. This is one way to visualize it. So, um, so what these plots are showing, if you take a, uh, so if you pick a point anywhere in here, and then you follow the magnetic field from that point and go around the torus, you know, dozens or hundreds of times, then each time, uh, so this would be like a poloidal cross section of the tokamak. So you pick some point, and then you follow the magnetic field around the tokamak. And when it goes through this poloidal cross section, you make another dot. And you keep on doing this hundreds and hundreds of times until you fill up a plot like this. It's called a Poincare surface of section plot. And um, if the if there were no magnetic fluctuations at all, if it were just the pristine magnetic flux surfaces that we try to produce in Kokomak, what you would see is a single color. So we're we're labeling um, each radial location like this with a single color. So what you would see is that there would be individual bands very well separated vertical bands like this um, with distinct colors. Uh, but what we actually see from the simulations is that the so you can see, for example, blue blue um, dots scattered throughout the whole plot. Same with red. You see red dots scattered throughout the whole plot. What this means is that these steel lines are wandering wherever they want to eventually as you go around the torus. And this is what happens with um, the, the full magnetic fluctuation uh, from the simulation. If we just take out the part from the unstable eigen mode, there's a little bit of wandering, but not too much. So um, the blue band is really limited to this region here. The red band is limited to this region here. There's even regions without any, the, the field lines just don't get to. Uh, so this is a demonstration that if you just consider the single unstable eigen mode, the, uh, the field does not become chaotic. But when you consider multiple eigen modes, uh, even the stable eigen, the linearly stable eigen modes that are excited, the field does become stochastic and you get this electromagnetic heat flux. All right, so this is another uh, look at the, uh, the eigen mode picture for turbulence. This is going back to the simple reduced gyrokinetic model that I described yesterday with the Hermit basis in velocity space. Uh, we're doing away with a lot of the complexities of tokamak, so we're not looking at any of the curvature, a very simple slab system. Uh, we're not even looking at a shear magnetic field. So kind of the simplest, simplest system that uh, has some connection with the, with the tokamak. And we can look at the, what we wanted to do here is look in detail at the Eigen modes, the linear eigen modes in a simple system, and um, and see how they are manifest, if at all, in the nonlinear turbulence. So the um, I won't focus on a lot of the details, but just looking right here, um, this is the this is the unstable IPG mode. So this is a the complex plane, the real frequency right here, the growth rate on this side. This is the unstable IPG mode right here. It's the only one above zero, which means it's the only unstable mode. 
This one right here is some stable drift wave. And these down here are the Landau roofs. So these are the roofs that you would find from calculating doing the Laplace transform and calculating the Landau damping rates. Now, this is the this is the full linear operator. You have the um, uh, the Landau damping term, the collisions, and the gradient drive. All three in here. This is the full linear operator. Um, I won't talk about these guys, but this guy is interesting because this is the linear operator without the collisions. And um, the spectrum here, you have this continuum of modes um, with zero growth rate. These are what you'd call case Van Kampen modes. And then there's this, um, this mode right here. I call this the mirror ITG mode because it has the same frequency and exactly the opposite growth rate as the ITG mode. So, um, so I was kind of puzzled by why this mode is there in the collisionless system, but disappears in the collisional system. And uh, and it turns out that it um, reappears in the nonlinear simulation in a sense. So I'll show how that happens. So for this, we decided to. Uh, to um, use a technique called pseudospectra. And basically what this is doing is, is realizing that in a system like this turbulent system, the linear spectrum is kind of an artificial thing because there's a big nonlinearity there as well, right? So pseudospectra is a linear approach, but kind of halfway in between the pure linear picture and the nonlinear picture, because it asks what happens if you take the linear operator here, this is A, and you perturb it. So just some arbitrary perturbation of some amplitude. So, um, and what we get, this is the, the, the Xs are the actual linear, uh, the, the linear frequencies, the linear eigenvalues. And these contours are all the locations in the complex plane where the linear operator plus some perturbation is an eigenvalue. So if you talk, follow a, scene, a, a certain contour, Everywhere on this contour, there's some perturbation of the same amplitude that gives you an eigenvalue on this contour. Um, that makes sense. Any questions on that? It's a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit of a uh, abstract concept. Um, so basically, what what you get from this is um, when you have a perturbed a system that's perturbed away from the linear eigen mode to a certain degree, anywhere on a single contour is equally viable as a linear resonance or eigenmode or eigenvalue of the system. So you might expect with a nonlinearity that uh, if the nonlinearity perturbs something to a certain degree, that you, um, you know, might have actual fluctuations or nonlinear eigenvalue, nonlinear eigenvalue, so to speak, that could be anywhere, you know, in, in very places in the complex play much different from the actual eigenvalues. Okay, so we took the, the turbulence data and we looked at these uh, pseudospectra along with the linear uh, eigenvalues. And then we constructed what's called, what we call a nonlinear eigenvalue. And as far as I know, we invented this uh, procedure. What we did was uh, we took the singular value decomposition and we took the singular vector from that and we scanned the complex plane. So this is kind of an eigenvalue problem, right? Um, operator on a vector, but we, we prescribed the vector. We get the vector from the nonlinear uh, simulation data. And then we scanned the complex planes. So we're choosing different eigenvalues, so to speak. And then we minimize this. So basically, given the nonlinear structure, we're asking where in the complex plane is its closest to being an eigenvalue. And uh, we found some interesting things. First of all, we found a couple of things that are not, well, kind of reassuring, I guess, namely that there are nonlinear eigenvalues that generally lie quite close to the unstable IPG mode, which we would expect if that's really the dominant thing in the system. There's also one that is close to this drift wave. And then the surprising interesting thing is this guy right here. So this guy right here, 
is basically in the position of this mirror IPG. So we have this IPG mode. If you remember, I showed the collisionless spectrum where there's this mode with the opposite broker, but it disappeared in the collisional spectrum. But now in the nonlinear uh, turbulence, it apparently reappears, despite the fact that the linear operator doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't uh, find that as an eigenvalue in the linear spectrum. Uh, once you go nonlinear, it um, it reappears and it's quite a prominent um, nonlinear structure in the system. Now I'm not showing this here, but what we found is that the um, so for each place in the complex plane using this pseudo spectra of spectrum approach, you can extract the corresponding eigenvector at that, the, the closest thing to an eigenvector at that point in the complex plane. And what we found is that indeed in this region right around this mode right here. The eigenvector eigenvectors from the pseudo spectra have properties very similar to this mirror IPG mode. So the um, again, I guess if we're, we're talking about recurring themes, the theme here is that the extra dimension, the phase space dimension in uh, in plasma turbulence has a lot of interesting uh, phenomena. Okay, another interesting thing here is um, we found that. As you go to higher um, parallel wave numbers for lambda adapt, you would expect lambda adapt to be quite strong. In nonlinear turbulence, it's been shown in various places that the lambda adapting is not as effective, not as strong as you would expect in a turbulent. So, in a, in a turbulent setting, the lambda adapting is not as strong as you would expect from the linear picture. And this, um, this reinforces that. What we found is that this is the, so this is the linear. Eigen mode, it's very strongly adapted from land adapting. But you look at these contours and you see that they're very strongly distorted right around this in the vertical direction. So, with a little perturbation from the nonlinearity, uh, anywhere, you know, quite, quite far away in the complex plane, it's still a viable resonance of the perturbing system. And indeed, what we found is that the actual nonlinear structures. Tend to lie very close to zero, so they're not they're they're really weakly adapted, despite the fact that the um, linear uh, the linear uh, prediction would tell you that they're strongly adapted. Okay, so getting away from fusion for a minute, just a, a few more examples of um, uh, interesting applications of uh, some of these techniques. Um, this was, uh, so at the University of Wisconsin, they had an experiment trying to uh, mimic or reproduce the, um, the dynamo of the, the dynamo in the earth that creates the earth's magnetic field. And uh, so they had, they had basically propellers um, in that this is a spherical experiment. It's actually liquid sodium. Which is actually very dangerous. They had to put it miles and miles away from campus for safety reasons. Um, so they have propellers that drive a certain flow pattern um, uh, at the top and the bottom, so kind of this in this region here. And, this region here. and the goal was to um, create a flow pattern that that um, that uh, creates a, a large magnetic field in order to understand the production of the Earth's magnetic field, for example. And uh, the experiment was not as they did a lot of great work, but it was not as successful as they expected. It, it wasn't as successful in producing it, uh, wasn't um, successful in producing a, a dynamo. And so um, this graduate student, Angelo Limone, uh, did MHD simulations to try to understand what was happening and maybe understand what was preventing the dynamo from forming. So uh, we took this um, simulation data, and again, we, we did a proper orthogonal decomposition. And the first mode of this decomposition turned out to be exactly what um, was expected from and predicted from this uh, the, the propeller. And this was the flow that was predicted to produce a dynamo. And uh, then it got interested, interesting as you look at the secondary structures that are um, excited in the turbulence. The color here shows the uh, amplitude of the, the flow. So just the magnitude of the flow. Um, this first structure 
has the symmetry that you would expect. You have propellers going in different directions, so that the, the blue and the red mean different directions. But the second structure here is interesting because it violates that symmetry. So you would expect you know, some odd symmetry going from here to here. Uh, but it is interesting that uh, um, in time, the symmetry is, is kind of maintained because this shifts direction uh, in time. So it shifts from being you know, red, blue, at one point in time to being blue red at another point in time. And it turns out that the second uh, the second um, structure inhibit, inhibits the dynamo mechanism. And um, and so you can so that they can, you know, you can take some some frozen um, uh, flow field and then calculate what dynamo you expect from that. Um, so we did that for this structure and it was much more uh, proficient for dynamo uh, for, for the dynamo than both of these structures combined. So we went back to the experimentalists of Wisconsin and um, they looked at this and said, okay, well, we can, let's build a little baffle right here to disrupt or to, to kind of get in the way of this flow pattern. And they did that and it was um, actually good. It actually, it actually uh, produced the, the best results that they, that they, they had gotten on that experiment was wasn't good enough to get a really uh, strong dynamo, but they did get the best results that they had seen on that experiment. Okay, so we're almost out of time. I will just um, note that these ideas um, of uh, mode decomposition, proper orthogonal decomposition, or eigenmode decomposition, they're being applied more and more in various states and astrophysics problems. This is an example. Um, a, of a application in Kelvin Helmholtz, Kelvin Helmholtz turbulence, and um, and all right, so almost done. I'll leave it there, and we'll. Uh, any, any questions? Any questions? Yes. Well, actually, I didn't really get quite clear what is the uh, mirror IPG in when you when uh, why it disappears and and uh, mirror IPG when you uh, put the collision on radio. Yeah, that's actually a really good question, and I never um I never figured that out quite frankly. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Swanish, I think we we talked about this once, and you said you have some ideas for why that might happen. Um, doesn't enter my head. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we we never did figure out figure that out. It's you probably need some you know linear algebra, some sophisticated um, linear algebra, uh, some 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 really uh, more sophisticated math than I'm capable of. Uh, operator theory, and who knows what to, to really sort that out. So it's an interesting question, but I never have the the, the, the time or inclination to the math room. Um, but the uh, the surprising interesting thing to us is that despite it being gone from the linear spectrum, it reappeared in the nonlinear turbulence. Yes. As a previous experience with thermal plasma interaction, many um, experiments I can understand. So I'm using the form to go quickly here in the about all the extract time, but I need to after going back to have the source frame more easy way so I can bring the, uh, the such uh, knowledge to me and time. Could you mind that example uh, you think it good uh, for starting not from it plasma but at the same time not uh, yeah now are, are you looking for information about uh, fluid turbulence or plasma turbulence or okay yeah, sure. Um, so I will put these slides on, you know, I'll post these slides for the uh, the, the, the meeting. And um, I'll add kind of bibliography with some material along those lines also. Another yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to read in details, but at the same time, I would like to find in myself and I'm studying kids. To, to build up my science. So I, I don't want to just go into a difficult point. So I, 
make me crash with the information and just find myself like I can't understand and go back again. No, I don't want to that. So could you comment that point so I can read more in this uh, point and try to go through? It's just one uh, point. No? Okay, I didn't quite catch the the question. I mean, I you mean, asked first of all. You asked for um. Then to train. Yes. Yes. We start with that Okay. Um. So that sounds very much like your first question, though. Is that how's it different from your first question? <laughs> this is a a point, but this is just one point. And the uh, two points will start with. Uh, so may I suggest that you can talk to David, say I can start something, mm -hmm. so that um, you have very specific thing and that's not from fear I thought. So, but by all means, yeah, please. Right. Any more questions? So I, I hope that you have gotten at least a very broad overview of various uh, approaches to turbulence. And uh, so the subject of turbulence is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. And uh, sometimes it's misused the word, but, but the fact of the matter is that almost nothing remains in the so-called linear state. Although, one could philosophically ask the question, uh, uh, what exactly does terminism do? Okay. And um, so it's kind of interesting to ponder. Uh, you guys know this simple lens is law, right? So what it does is that uh, if there is a force which is trying to drive the system somewhere, then the system generates a reaction to it, all right? And it basically tries to kill that cause. Okay? So you have you have a um, uh, large part, let's suppose it's confined, it has large and radius. So somehow the plasma generates forces, processes by which the radiance needs to be eliminated. So the entire business that we are trying to do there is you want to keep. Uh, a state which is uh, unnatural, so to say, but the moment you create it, it resists. It basically wants to go back to its uh, uniform distribution everywhere. So most of the phenomena that you're finding are reaction to the conditions which are imposed, which you try to impose on that. Plasma wants to be free like a bird, like a bee. Yeah, it wants to be all of one. And every time you try, or for that matter, a fruit. Okay, so, so so what you have to often understand is that um, um, the instability that we talk about, right? So instability really is a mechanism by which the system wants to get back to its linear stage. I mean, but it will be a different linear stage. It will be a different equilibrium. Different Right? Because I mean, it doesn't put the uh, so eventually everything wants to be in some large space to be force free. Nobody likes to be under pressure. And uh, so you can philosophically begin to think that okay, whenever I have a situation, it wants to free itself from those constraints. Okay, and therefore it will generate motions, you know, in order to counteract the things which are containing it. And turbulence is exactly or the instability is exactly a mechanism by which the system is trying to react to uh, the things which uh, it which is being stopped from doing its max tendencies. And David introduced you to several things which are uh, totally worth pondering. And and I think that um, with uh, uh, the methodologies that we have studied direct. They have uh, done a very, very nice penetration into various modes of uh, analyzing techniques. You know, as you said, the analysis is so random, so difficult. So, making a proper analysis to extract all the information from that 
his faith. All right. And so um, um, just as much technology of extracting the information is just as important as understanding the physics. Because otherwise, how can you understand the physics if you don't even quite know what is it being consistent uh, on? Then there is a uh, they will also introduce you to the fact that you have a linear system and you understand it quite well. Linear. And then without doing anything, you kind of try to make it somewhat nonlinear. And that uh, uh, that changes the fundamental nature of the system that you may be thinking. Now there are many problems which you could build with your head in order to really understand that. I'm going to give you one problem you may ponder about. So let's suppose that our perturbation is part. Okay. Um, you, you, you don't have to take notes, it's so simple, so you know. And then our linear theory basically is that this is equal to zero, right? And then you find the roots of this theory. And then you say that these are the linear modes of the system. But really speaking, the system is not this because uh, this is true only when phi omega k goes to k. Okay. So those of you who might have read every article on what's called the response theory know that you take a perturbation and you let it go to zero. And then the response that you get can be positive. But really speaking, we have some matrix M. And some, let's suppose there was a quadratic nonlinearity. So then you would have a So the right hand always has to be the second thing that one omega prime and k prime are summed up. What is that is a function we have to be Okay. So you could say, look, what's the simplest nonlinear uh, correction I can make to the system? And again, following what David said, um, can we change its uh, it's linear dispersion ratio something. Because linear dispersion ratio tells us the dielectric property of the system. Okay? And uh, so we want to change the dielectric. So any change in this, for instance, it introduces an imaginary part is, is very important. Or which will take away the imaginary part of this thing and cancel it from there is very important, right? So there are, there, there are well-known procedures for this to, to play with it. So you take your simple system, diff wave, alpha and wave, or whatever hand. So what you do is out of all these junk of nonlinearities, okay? If you could pick up one single term, okay, which is of the force that there is some spectrum and then phi omega k and some stuff here. Right. So what this is called the term which is phased equivalent to the linear term. This has more meaning than everything else because this changes effectively the linear dispersion ratio. Okay. And so what you do is if you combine this one, you're, you can say that I have an effective dispersion relation uh, d omega k minus alpha this will be a sum, and both all right. So this is now a nonlinear modification to the linear dispersion. And, and the point is, this is simple. And from this, you can understand a very great amount that, you know, as if this particular goal is immersed in the bath of all other modes. 
Okay, and they have contributed an imaginary real part of that. And this change is more fundamental than the scattering which might take from the other modes. So this is always a good idea whether you can estimate that. I don't know if any one of you can print us poster. There, there's an example of this study that she's trying to do. And uh, and it's uh, it's a simple, very simple, nothing is nothing is simple now that they right? And that you when you want to add this change, you have to have a good data. But you should try to do similar exercises in the movies that you said. But I have done little principle. Yeah. They do write B I A equal to zero. When uh, and that, that is a linear expression. Yeah, yeah. But you say that it is uh maybe value linear V when I omega A tends to be yes. But we have read the other that if I omega A is not the no, that tends to be not without zero. Yeah. Ah, okay. That's the market there for a non-trivial solution can be to be. In fact, the dispersion relation is a condition which tells you that only to be satisfied, only then you can have non zero perturbation. But I, I must tend to be here. Yeah. All right, I think you guys should have some tea and then we come back. I want to talk about the people that are coming. 